TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are not. No, we are live. I'm going to edit that out. <clears throat> we are live. So you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK right behind me. <clears throat> Dang. You see it. Warning, just in case. Uh, Twitch.com. That's the website you can put in. The usernames at the bottom of the screen. That's where you can catch the lives and things of that nature. Um, also, we do got Patreon five days a week. This is Heist the Northern Bank Robbery. Talk to me. Copyright disclaimer under Section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational, or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. All rights belong to their respective owners. Talk to me. Hey, parking site. Hello, how are you doing? Um, I wanted to help me this section of the module of, of an abduction. Uh -huh. um, I actually work in the Northern Bank Thai Center. We've been um, robbed. That's rather calm. How isn't? much am I talking now? 30 minutes on the road. Oh my god. 30 million? Let me just watch. Who cares about bankers? Seriously. And most people want to deal for bankers, not justice. It's close to start, it? It's been handled 24 hours in yesterday. This was a violent and brutal crime. It was not some Robin Hood effort. several years, people were prepared to see a process of transition take place. Yeah. That is now over. Why must we wait while bank robbers decide what they'll do? What they're doing, folks, they're playing dirty politics with this peace process. The story. Let's skip all of that. Let's get to it. The Northern Bank Raid is among the biggest robberies of modern times, and yet so much of what happened is still a mystery. We're going to take a fresh look at what we know about the robbery and at what questions remain unanswered. It's Sunday night, it's the 19th of December 2004, Chris Ward is at home in his parents' home. He's watching football with his dad. Knock comes to the door and a man says to him, all right, Chris, I'm here to talk to you about Celtic. This didn't strike Chris as unusual. He was used to people calling at the house. But then he realized there was a second man. Very quickly, it became clear that they were there for something other than what they had said. They made clear to Chris what it was to do with his work and that if they cooperated, they would be fine. But if they didn't, they'd be dead. It's just over four weeks since the Northern Bank headquarters here in Belfast was robbed. In a television first, we hear the account of one of the bank's employees. It's all well good, Sam. If you ever kidnapped, you never ever... They was bold. They came to broke crib. <laughs> 30 million on that. Hey, hey, they came to broke crib. Kidnapped them, that's tough. Your payout, then you, you phone this confidential helpline, but... You know, that's a Superman story, like, you know, what's going to happen is... <laughs> Superman want to fly through your window and beat these men up and save your family. I mean, this is, this is serious, serious reality stuff. It's extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, it doesn't happen very often. You get somebody right in the eye of the storm to then agree to do an interview and, and tell his story. They think to himself, it's impossible to rob this bank. So does that mean they're going to kill my family? So we're now in the heart of County Down, and by this stage, the McMullins have been held at gunpoint for at least an hour. Kevin is told, we can leave your car in a way that's beyond repair. 
they go to put some masking tape across Karen's eyes. She's utterly and completely powerless. Eventually, they take her to a house where she will remain prisoner for virtually 24 hours. And she's told, there's a bed, go to sleep. She refuses, terrified of the prospect of, of sexual assault. She talks about hearing Makes plastic sense. rustled. She then later on heard zips. She thought it was a body bag. She thought she was going to die. Totally terrifying. Totally terrifying. Sounds like this bank was thought to be like unravelable, and they went to full length to prove them wrong. This sounds like a like a like a let me prove you wrong type robbery, like a macho thing. Like, no, nah, we can do it. A guy came in and said, "Right, come on," and he brought me into a room where I seen Kevin um, tied up and sitting on a mattress. Chris and Kevin are told explicitly what their job was the following day. And if they want to see their families, they're going to have to Dang. obey the instructions of these men. The pure technique itself, tiger kidnapping, you take hostages. As a result of taking those hostages, you force an employee of an institution to behave outside the norm. That's part and parcel of the fabric of organised crime in Northern Ireland, including the paramilitaries, but it's not unique to the paramilitaries. This was a military operation. It was clear to the people who were held hostage that some of those in their house were basically answering in a line of command, and they viewed this very clear. I feel like banks get robbed more in the UK. I know it happens in America, like, occasionally, but, like, I've never in my life, like... Like... You, like it seems like it's not it seems like it's few and far in between like it don't happen a lot anymore it's too risky clearly as people who were in a in a very sophisticated criminal gang i never like drove past a bank and never been police outside and like oh yeah they got robbed that's never happened they know much about the bank. They knew an awful lot. It's actually terrifying to think how much they knew. It quickly became apparent to the kidnapped bank staff that the gang knew the bank inside out, and banks and their security systems are complicated. Conclusion? This was an inside job. Yeah, an inside job. Um, I discovered from, from people who worked actually in the cash centre, if that robbery hadn't taken place on that particular Monday morning. It couldn't have taken place because the key holders will no longer be the gatekeepers to the cash centre in the Northern Bank. So that was another indication that somebody inside the bank had inside information about the potential changes in security which would frustrate their plan to rob the bank. Chris has got a little bit of sleep. Kevin has got no sleep at all. But their instructions are to go to work as normal. Chris. Clock in at... Chris Wilde for getting any sleep. 12 o'clock. You had to act as if nothing was wrong. If you, if you phone this confidential helpline at the bank, say you have to, you know, your family were gone, like, and that's, that's the reality of this. Footage? With the best will in the world, you can see that uh, Kevin and Chris were in an impossible situation. A couple of weeks earlier, they'd been uh, put through a training course to teach them what to do in a situation like this. But bottom line is, your family are at risk. What are you going to do? What would you have done? Comply. What the hell? I ain't, see, that's why I can't work this job. There, yeah, just in case of these, that, like in training, they come up to me like, yeah, just in case of situations like, all of that is out the window. 
You ain't even got to have my family. I'm going to be 100 with you. All you got to hand me is a piece of paper that say, give me the money. And I'm, here you go. All I'm going to do is press the button when they, when they done. I'd have thought of my family. The panic button. Me too. Because at the end of the day, they are not going to pay my family out if I lose my life trying to protect these, this money that's insured. So, absolutely not. Now, what's going on here is that they're taking money mm. and they're getting ready to do that famous dummy run. Mm. So once the staff went home, we were instructed to get my sports bag and fill it full of hundreds of fifties. They, they take that cash box out of sight and then they put the money, they drop it into that sports bag. Nobody asked to look in your bag. Not one person, no. Just walked out of the bank and that was it. Over a million pounds in my bag and I was freaky stuff like. It's that easy. That was a test run, right? Coming out the, the door, goes to a bus stop, sits down and waits for the waits for the contact. And bang in the middle of Belfast beside the city hall. The police don't swoop down. And then, the robbers know the plan's working. It's game on. Our next instruction was then to start preparing the money from the safe to get that out. Is this the same day? What Kevin had to do was phone the control room and tell the control room that there was a removal company coming out to collect rubbish from the Kai Center. The green crates are what new money comes in. So the instruction from the gangsters were to bring all the green crates and get it all into the bullion bay. So when we come up with all our all the first crates, which we were saying was rubbish, we buzzed uh, the control room. They allowed us through the various doors, and we had to do that four times. Once the van arrived, the guy from the control room shouted into us. Because the actual guy, he was talking to us when we were bringing this money down. And that was really, really frightening for me and Kev because if he had asked to open one of the, the cases, he would have seen millions and millions of pounds. Like. I feel like some, some procedures were not followed by the control room or something. Yeah, this is just, this is just trash. Come on now. This sounds like a, a robbery waiting to happen. Well, if you listen to uh, uh, the security man that I spoke to who had been in charge of security, he was saying that, you know, this was waiting to happen. They were downgrading security to the extent that they were at risk. See what I'm saying? I already knew it. They were downgrading security to the point where they were at risk. It's just... The security of the bank had been uh, put out to a private company. The owners of the bank, they had cut the, the, the budget by something like a third. You get what you pay for. The robbers got away with more than 16 million pounds in that run, mostly 20 pound and 10 pound notes, but brand new. What I always find amazing is that the robbers then turned to them and said, yeah, we're going to do a second run. They really were bold, weren't they? So they did a test run, a first run, where they got 16 million. So that's 17 and some change. And then they did a, third, a, a second run to cap it off for 30. They was really taking chances. When they'd finished packing the van with all the cases, the green cases, the guy gave me 
that clean film stuff and said, you 15 minutes to fill as many cages as you can with 20 pound notes. And this is the bit you would think that if somebody was watching CCTV would think was a bit odd. Right. He's walking around, rapping. And that's all? That crater. All in view? The second consignment is wrapped up in this silage wrap, but that's the used notes, right? That's the notes that are easiest to shift, the ones that you might think a robber would be going for first. new money you can like track because serial numbers are big. At the same time as Kevin and Chris are moving the trolleys of cash into the bullion bay, Karen is moved a second time. <laughs> Eventually they take Karen to what turns out to be Drumkira Forest. For her life. This is what she said in, in court. For hours now, I was thinking that they were going to kill me. And I was waiting for the bullet in the back of the head. They would have did that. That wouldn't have been good for business, though. That wouldn't have been good. Man. I asked him to get my getaway. body back to my family. The thing is, the raiders nearly got caught. A couple was coming down the street. They spotted a van here with two suspicious looking characters. They don't make a connection between the bank and the suspicious characters, but they do think something is odd. So they go up into the streets. They look for the first person in uniform. Happens to be a traffic warden. Traffic warden. What the hell is he going to do? No, I'm just playing. Uh, it's always a concerned citizen, I'm telling you. It's on to the police. I always tell y'all this in police interceptors or any police show. The, you them concerned citizens be saving, saving stuff. Phones through just about immediately. But the problem was that phone call came exactly one minute after these cameras recorded the van driving off a total amount, 26 and a half million pounds. And it's gone. I just could not understand that we handed out that money. We were relieved in a sense at this stage, not relieved altogether because we did, still didn't know whether these men were going to turn around and say, damage the family anyway. The instruction was to go back to my house in Poglas. When I went in and I seen my whole family sitting there, I was like, thank God. And on one hand, I was delighted, but at the same time, I didn't know whether Karen was okay. to me to phone the police at 11 o'clock. Police emergency. Hello. Wait, they, wait. It's shocked to me to phone the police at 11 o'clock. They instructed him to phone? Police emergency. Hello. How are you doing? I wonder if you could help me. Um, my name is Chris Ward. I, I actually work in the Northern Bank Tide Shepherd. Did you see? Ah, uh, you're wrong. Talk to him, how much? 30 minutes. Oh, my God. 30 minutes. Okay, Mr. Ward, since we've had another report there, so we're just trying to link stuff up here. Yes. Colin McMullen, is that Kevin's wife? That's Kevin's wife. Yep, uh-huh. Hello, 
How long did they hold you for a charge? We held it 24 hours in yesterday. From 24 hours, what are you going? Don't know what sort of money they stole, sir. I'd imagine it's a big amount. Ah, uh, yeah, 30 million. 30 million. This is kind of a well thought out situation. I, I don't condone any of it, but like. Where did they go wrong? Probably the money got tracked because you got 30 million dollars like you can't like what's the point you can't even spend it they're gonna track the money unless you like somehow some way like slowly but surely wash it but like it's 30 mil Police are estimating that over 20 million pounds was stolen from a bank in Belfast in what could be the biggest cash robbery ever seen in the United Kingdom. There are on record a number of gangs in Northern Ireland who could carry out uh, an attack of this nature. But clearly, uh, in terms of Northern Ireland, you have to take it as, as red. There are a number of paramilitary groups who clearly have the expertise and the ability to carry this out. The police investigation so far seems to have centered on nationalist areas of Belfast. I remember thinking at the time, you know, maybe even hoping that it had been carried out by what we call then ODCs, ordinary decent criminals, not the IRA, because if the IRA had carried it out, well, that raised uh, big questions about the Republican movement's commitment to peace, because the peace process was there, where it was still working. And you couldn't believe that the IRA would carry out a robbery like this and put the peace process at risk. Raid makes global headlines. The New York Times said that the level of sophistication involved in the robbery was most often found in Northern Ireland's rival outlawed groups, particularly the Irish Republican Army. There's been so much going on this year. They've been so close to a deal. Why would provisionals risk peace? The bank robbery happened at a critical point in the peace process. Since the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, there had been numerous failed attempts to get a devolved government up and running in Belfast. Just before the robbery, at the end of 2004... Maybe that was a part of the plot. Do it when least expected. Hmm. The DUP and Sinn Féin were closer than ever to a deal. Unionists have been calling on the chief constable to come clean on who he thinks was responsible. I think it was acknowledged um, in the media at the time that if I got it wrong, I would be out of a job. I think that's a fair assessment. I had to be absolutely clear I was right, and at the point I was clear, I made the statement. Oh. Hugh Ord came out today to tell the policing board and the press who he believes was behind the Northern Bank robbery. It was a policing assessment with huge political implications. Yeah, this is a risky moment, man. On the basis of the investigative work we've done to date, the evidence we have collected, in my opinion, the provisional IRA were responsible for this crime and all main lines of inquiry currently undertaken are in that direction. Mm. Was it or was it not? The official word which was now coming out of the PSNI from Hugh Ward yep. that the IRA definitively carried out the robbery, whatever the denials of Martin McGuinness and Jerry Adams. I am satisfied on the basis of the conversation that I had with uh, a very senior person in the IRA that the IRA were not involved. Surely natural justice would suggest that if someone is prepared to make yeah. such, <coughs> such a, a statement, that they're prepared to back it up with proof. Right. That's a fair assessment. It still took you more than two weeks to say anything. Being chief in Northern Ireland was an interesting place to be chief because you had all these far more complex political implications of on what you did. Has your, has your conclusion changed at all in the years since? No. There were a number of crimes we would attribute to the provisional IRA and robberies during that time. The whole of the IRA did not suddenly stop doing what it did as the Good Friday Agreement was signed. It takes time to work that through. We were dealing with the end game in terrorism. And what we had was a brutal crime, which in my judgment was part of that fallout and that end game in terrorism. My job was to try and solve it. But of course, you had to have a real awareness of what was going on in the politics around you. People keep 
can't just do regular crime no more. That's not out, not in Ireland. Everything's politically driven here. He told because of the ongoing circumstances. It was the IRA before, and Hugh Ward wasn't going to change his tune inside Downing Street today. The obstacle now to a lasting and durable settlement in Northern Ireland is the continuing paramilitary activity, criminal activity of the IRA. It has got to stop. I brought the news to Tony Blair. He was shocked. We had invested a lot of time and effort to try and bridge the gap between the DUP and Sinn Féin. And at Leeds Castle in September of that year, we had got in effect two principles we thought agreed. One was the DUP would share power with Sinn Féin. The other was that the IRA would go out of business by Christmas. The only bit that wasn't agreed was how we'd validate the act of decommissioning. We were that close. We know that... I don't think that was the plan for them. <laughs> the plan was to let y'all think that. I feel like the IRA might have had something else up their sleeve. The DUP at this point, the whole entire we're time. looking for photographic evidence of the IRA actually decommissioning their weapons. The IRA needs to make a million. And they need to wear their sackcloth and ashes not in a back room, but openly. So a couple of weeks later then, the IRA come out and say, we are still committed to the peace process, but we will not submit to a process of humiliation. Was it a signal from the Republican movement to the British government to say, we are bargaining now from a position of strength. Look what we can do and look, no lives were lost. There was a sense that the Republican community was not only being taken for granted, but also humiliated. That may have partly driven the thinking behind Northern Bank robbery. This may have been their way of saying, don't take us for granted. Yeah. Don't think yeah, we've gone. Yeah, I said that earlier. This seemed like, like some let me show you something type energy. <laughs> See? Let me try to tell you. Way. Damn! No one's been convicted of the robbery. And yet, the authorities south, authorities here, utterly convinced, I mean certain, that it was the IRA. For me, the biggest and abiding question, did Jerry Adams and Mark McGuinness know about the robbery in advance? Because if they did sanction it, and if they did know about it in advance and didn't stop it or do something to, to push it to the side, it would seem to me that Either they're utterly ineffectual in terms of the Republican leadership, or they're completely and totally cynical. It's a hard one to figure out. Why has the Chief Constable and the PSNI not arrested these people and questioned them? If they had prior knowledge, then there is information there. Do you think Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness would have to have known about this before it went ahead? Based on uh, intelligence and information that we were getting uh, at the, the time. It, it's fairly clear that uh, this was such a major event and it would have had such an impact uh, on the political process of which Sinn Féin were a part that they, uh, the organisation could not have carried it out without the sanction of uh, those who were leading the political uh, end of the, the movement. It is of concern to me that an operation of this the magnitude it was obviously being planned at a stage when I was in negotiations uh, with those that uh, would, would know the, uh, the leadership uh, of, of the provisional movement. The Taoiseach has made remarks which I take grave exception to. I, I can tell you I would be a very disillusioned Irish Republican if someone said to me they were prepared to put a process that I have put my life and soul into, risk my very life for, at risk for 10 or 20 or 30 million pounds, in my opinion, it would not be worth it. Okay, okay thank you. I had to be absolutely clear that we felt um, that we were badly let down. 
Do you think they knew about the robbery in advance? Uh, I don't know. I mean, is the answer to, 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 to that. It's a good answer. We had no evidence on, on, on Adams and McGuinness. We it's said that at the time. We weren't criminalising, but... You know, neither did we think that this was done by two or three fellows in, in the IRA and that nobody else knew anything about it. We, we, we didn't buy that. There was a furious response from Dublin, and Dublin really mattered at this point. Bertie Hearn had been broken the Republican movement for 10 years at this stage. Yeah. There is a, a sinister view that you can continue the development of politics on one side and criminality uh, on the other. And yes, Deputy Kenny, there was a view for some time that there was a toleration of it to try to move from, from A maybe to C or D. Um, but 10 years on, you, you cannot continue doing that. There's a sense there that almost that he had been turning a blind eye to some IRA criminality in the past. Yeah, I think there have been, uh, you know, o over the uh, the period from 98 on, uh, there had been a, a number of cases uh, where it had been reported that there was a belief that the provisional IRA were involved. None of those were things that we were, were happy with. At the same time, you did understand that the provisional IRA were not like the American army or the British army where everybody was on the payroll and everybody was under command. So you believe that there was a particular time where the political leadership would get time to bring people uh, to heel. I think that that's the story of the peace process, bringing people who are engaged in military actions to a place where they are engaged only in, pe in peaceful activity. And, you know, I think that that did take time. Can that ever really be a real thing? If you felt, if you at one point felt so, if you felt so moved by something that you started going to war about it can i can i then go back and be peaceful no because this is in my heart i want to be like i want to be negative negativity is in me it it, it 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 was placed in me on some revenge type or on some on some i have to the love of my country type energy i got to be like this I just don't think that you can just turn people into peaceful people like that when they have a mindset like that. Because it's too ingrained. And it ain't ingrained like on the outside. This is ingrained in their heart. This is ingrained on their brains. It's over. Time. There's, there's going to be some people, but there's not. There, there's going to be some people that you, that'll see the bigger picture, but there's not. there's going to be a lot of people that don't give a damn and they want they want problems they want negativity they want revenge for what's been done to somewhere along that a family member or something i think that adams and mcginnis ultimately did want the ira to go away but at the time of their choosing they seen it as a, a valuable bargaining tool and they were not going to give it up before they'd squeezed every last ounce of negotiating Power out of it. Did you think Mark McGuinness or, and or Jerry Adams knew about the robbery in advance? My personal view is no. The senior leadership was committed to delivering the peace process. This had no logical place at all in that process. I still, they still, they got away with 27 M's. What's the fee to wash 27 M's? Gotta be like seven, eight million of it gone off top. There clearly were tensions between the political leadership of the Republican movement and the military leadership of the Republican movement. I, I come to something I was told by a man who had been top table in the IRA, an opponent of Jerry Adams in the end, and he said to me, the political leadership didn't always know what the military leadership was doing, even though they could all be sitting on the one and only seven-person army council. If Jerry... 
Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness didn't know about the robbery in advance. Who then could have masterminded it? The brains behind these activities was Bobby's story. Um, and it, th that is generally acknowledged by security forces, by intelligence, army intelligence, the lot. Story has been uh, implicated in most of the big operations. Why are they sitting so close? Uh, Not because I'm curious, like, I'm, I want to know. Implicated in most of the big operations. We have a message for the British government, for the Irish government, for the cabal that's out there. We ain't going away, you know. Of all the people in the IRA, I haven't met anyone more intelligent than Bobby Stroud. I used to walk the yard of them, Crumlin Road Jail, 1976. Bobby ran an effect of spying. I believe that Bobby's story had the capacity to pull together a team that would have been impenetrable. Well, had we had evidence that he was engaged in that way, we'd have arrested him and charged him, and we didn't. Well, what did you think at the time? Well, my sense of it was I would have been surprised if he hadn't known about it. But that's a huge mental leap between knowing about it and being involved in it, and I don't know, is the honest answer. Everybody's answer is I don't know. The IRA got away with about 16.5 million pounds in new banknotes on the first run. They would have known that these were traceable notes and so we can assume that they were trying to get rid of them as quickly as possible, but they couldn't have anticipated what would happen next. What happened next? They intend to withdraw all their banknotes from circulation and to reissue them in a different colour and style. So in essence, this large robbery has become the largest theft of waste paper in the living history of Northern Ireland. robbery was so immense that they made them change the bank notes and the whole style of the bank and the whole style of the money? It'll take about eight weeks to print the notes, but the Northern clearly feels that this is the, the best way it can help to render at least a proportion of what was stolen worthless. Dang. It became very quickly clear to the IRA that this money was not, it was not possible to spend it. So what do you do with it? One of the questions that I am trying to get to the bottom of is, could they have spent some of the money that was traceable? At that point, I was in the Assets Recovery Agency. I was the director of the office in Belfast. I think it was a, the absolutely right thing to do to take all the banknotes out of circulation. The reality was that a, a proportion of those could well... Seems expensive. I mean, less than 16 million. They'll have been laundered by the time the, the um, action went on. The IRA already had a substantial network stretching to various countries around the world where they could send money, get it converted into property or other transactions, and then it would gradually be filtered back into the UK or Ireland in a form that appeared to be legitimate. There's a lot of sympathisers involved with paramilitary groups. So some people would not perceive it as a crime. They would perceive it as a funding operation. There's also the professionals, professional business people who would help them um, get it into the system. What the IRA didn't know was that their money laundering operation was about to be rumbled. Seven people have been arrested and more than two million pounds seized. Irish police are investigating a possible connection with the Northern Bank robbery just before Christmas. The Gothi say four people, three men and a woman, are being held in Cork, where a substantial amount of money has been seized. On the face of it, this looks like a major money laundering <coughs> operation. The first major breakthrough in the robbery happens on the 16th of February, south of the border in Dublin. The Irish police swoop on a car outside of Houston at train station. They arrest this man, 
Cork chef Don Bullman. They find the best part of £70,000 in a Daz soapbox in his possession. That same day, two men, both members of Sinn Féin, are arrested in Cork. George Hegarty and Tom Hanlon. Tommy Hanlon, you're a Sinn Féin politician. What do you have to say about your arrest here? Do you want to have your say, Tommy, here? No. no Tom no, Hanlon, no. he was a councillor of yours until 2004. Have you met him? Do you know him? No, I haven't met him, and, and I don't know. To my knowledge, it isn't a crime to be arrested. Or at least not yet. Neighbours of this man, Don Blaney, report northern banknotes are floating up in the sky, some burnt, some half burnt. There appears to be some sort of fire going on in this man's property. He's arrested. 220 Kalashnikov bullets are later found in his property. £50,000 in brand new northern bank notes is found at the PSNI's Sports and Social Club in Belfast up at New Forge Lane. The police clearly believe the money was planted here. They said in a statement that they think it's being used as a distraction to the series of raids that have taken place this week on both sides of the border. I'm not particularly impressed by it, but I did ask them to give the money back in my first press conference. They started to listen. Detectives found £2.4 million in six holdalls and one plastic bag in the basement of this house belonging to Cork moneylender Ted Cunningham. Ted Cunningham, a fascinating character here. He had a finance company called Chester. All them companies getting jammed up. Chesterton Finance. When the Irish police raid his Silver. house, they find £2.4 million in sterling notes. And then we go to a very significant development in Dublin. The resignation from the post of chairman of the Bank of Scotland, Ireland, by this man, Phil Flynn, who was in business with Ted Cunningham. Can you tell us what role does Mr. Phil Flynn play in your company, Mr. Cunningham? Phil? Absolutely not, he can't. This is what he's in. Flynn's house had, and his business had been searched by the Irish police. Phil Flynn was a very important player in Irish business life. And he was also a former vice president of Sinn Féin. Most of these people are linked in one way or another to Sinn Féin or to the Republican movement. And in some of these cases, they're literally caught with their hands on the money. Today is a, a great day for cooperation between the police services north and south in Ireland. We've been told that to accuse people of uh, laundering money in large amounts on this island was in some sense uh, an attack on the peace process itself. All of that was false and all of those chickens have now come home to roost. In the wake of the robbery, what were the guards telling They had been studying um, various activities involving money laundering over a period of time and then they suddenly saw it awash with Northern Bank money. They knew what they were looking at. Originally, it was a Provo operation, so then they knew that the, uh, the Northern Bank money had found its way to the Provos and was, be, was in the process of being laundered uh, through uh, various uh, channels in the South. Follow the money trail, man. It's over. I know they got the snitch. Yeah, I got it from... Hold on. Th March 2008. <clears throat> Three years after the robbery, Ted Cunningham faced 10 charges of money laundering. And Ted, Ted Cunningham do? denied 10 charges of money laundering, but he admitted in custody knowing that the money found in his home came from the Northern Bank robbery. The accused while in custody also named Phil Flynn as the boss behind everything. Oh yeah, he got the snitching. I already knew it. I was told quite candidly that for nine months prior to the uh, Northern Bank robbery, the Irish Special Branch had been watching money going down the west coast of Ireland from Northern Ireland. They believed it was IRA money. The key figures whom Special Branch saw heading off to Bulgaria, which was one of the places that, that apparently it was going to be easy to launder money. One was Ted Cunningham and the other one was Phil Flynn. I'm an unrepentant Republican. Do you believe you could have been used in any way, money laundering, that no. you, in your past, anything no, that's been... I, I have, I've uh, had no involvement, good, bad or indifferent, in money laundering. Full stop.
There's an extraordinary assertion here from the most senior civil servant in the Irish Department of Justice. This man tells the American diplomats that Phil Flynn had been at the heart of the money laundering enterprise of the Northern Bank money and was, in his terms, an enemy of the state. This man, Phil Flynn, was an advisor to Bertie Ahern. <laughs> I mean, how, how do you make sense of that? He was never prosecuted. He was much less a charge with any offence relating directly to the Northern Bank robbery. Mm, he had too much power. <clears throat> he was untouchable. Couldn't trace him to it. Stayed out of it. Smart guy. If he was a part of it, he made himself invisible. Phil Flynn, would you have considered him a friend of yours at the time? Yeah, definitely. I presume that Phil would have known a lot of the old guards that were retiring at the time uh, from the Army Council. I think that's why the finger was probably put on him. Phil had moved long from, you know, from IRA activities to political Sinn Féin activities, and those events actually ended them all on him. I had a lot of regard for Phil Flynn, and still would have. Not me, buddy. Hold on, y'all. No Republican worthy of the name can be involved in criminality of any kind. If any are, they should be expelled from our ranks. Sinn Féin were under increasing pressure to like cut links control. with Republican paramilitarism and criminality. Another event, just a month after the robbery, drew international condemnation. The murder of Robert McCartney in Belfast. We know that IRA members took part in the murder. Then his family got involved. Didn't know about this one. They took their campaign to Dublin. They took their campaign to London. But crucially then, they took their campaign to Washington. Here we are going into St. Patrick's Day, trying to keep the peace process going. George Bush didn't ring me too often directly, but he did on that issue. His advice was that he shouldn't allow Sinn Féin in. And uh, I explained to him why I thought he should. We had to try and keep going. Uh, we had to try and build this back uh, together, to, together again. I think the message that Sinn Féin has heard uh, from the United States has been quite clear and quite unified across the political spectrum. It's time for the IRA to disband. This was only a few short years after 9-11, the rise of terrorism, and even if Irish America wasn't going to use that term or terminology with respect to Northern Ireland, there was still a sense that lawlessness and unbridled criminality was no longer acceptable. At the March 2005 American Ireland Fund dinner, uh, Senator John McCain was being honored, and he used that occasion to deliver a blistering condemnation of the IRA, right when Jerry Adams was sitting in the front row. Historians may look back at this time as a defining moment. The failure of the talks, followed by the bank robbery in Belfast and the IRA murder of Robert McCartney, that enough is enough. It was a turning point. And I think Jerry Adams was a smart enough man to recognize that he no longer would be welcome unless he did start to make these changes. This is Jerry Adams speaking on 6th of April after he's been to Irish America and really been shunned by the political establishment there. In the past, I have defended the right of the IRA to engage in armed struggle. I did so because there was no alternative for those who would not bend the knee or turn a blind eye to oppression. Now there is an alternative. That's an astonishing 
moment there. Jerry Adams is telling the IRA it's time to, to, to step aside. Jerry Adams. A quick little turnaround after that little scolding he got from America. Famously said, never waste a good crisis. Well, whether there was any strategic plan here to move to where they were at this point as fast as this or not, there was now the opportunity for him to say politics is dominant, this is the future, this is the moment for change. You know, it seems that the timing can't be... What happened to there? What happened to the sound? What happened to the sound? Yeah, there was about 50 seconds of sound missing. I skipped through it. Uh, almost. People are perceiving that he was some way involved in this. But at the end of the day, my conscience is totally clear. The prosecution claimed that the robbers had an inside knowledge of the bank's workings. That knowledge, they said, was consistent with Chris Ward's duties and position at the bank. Two years after the robbery, two suspects co co collapsed. Two years since the 26 million was stolen, the case against Dominic McAvoy has collapsed. A prosecuting lawyer told the court that a full file had been received from the police, but the director of public prosecutions concluded that the test for a prosecution had not been met. A second accused, 40-year-old Martin McAlisky, also had charges dropped. Today is a setback, I think it'd be fair to say. Uh, one man still does remain charged. You know, let's be clear on this. Uh, we don't <clears throat> pretend we can solve every crime that's committed, but this one... Well, I thought y'all was confident. Uh, ...still has a very large number of detectives engaged on it, and we will continue to pursue okay. all lines of inquiry that we can. Ward's trial. A man has gone on trial That's accused of one of the biggest cash robberies in British banking history. I get, okay. Chris Ward. Christopher Ward denies stealing 26 and a half million. Yeah, like, wasn't he the one that had his family kidnapped? In pounds from the Northern Bank in Belfast where he worked. That's, that's, that's crazy to turn their attentions to. It don't even make sense that he would do that. Yeah, bro, they had my family hostage. I did what they said do. And then I called the police. Why would I do any of that? I wouldn't like to uh, characterize it as a, as a single event. The legal description of a circumstance of case is that there are many strands to the rope which when bound together uh, hold tight. Um, the ropes came tumbling down in this case. There was a very strong thesis That's that was insane. being proposed by the police that Chris had uh, interfered with the rota. But where it collapsed was the fact that the rota was changed by management. Today, Chris Ward, accused of being the inside man in the country's biggest ever robbery, walked free. Of course he did. Police allowed their own prejudices uh, to prevail and convince themselves that it had to be an inside job. I would try to get some type of reparation. I'd sue. And they selected Chris as the inside mom. Well, I disagree with every bit of that rather banal statement, frankly. It was a very professional international investigation. It sounded like that. So after all the resources that were put into the Northern Bank investigation in Northern Ireland by the BSNI, turns out they couldn't get any convictions. Not Which one. is extraordinary when you think about the scale of it, the political significance of it, and the resources that the police put into this, and the huge vested interest they had in getting a conviction. I am absolutely... Four years later, now one conviction. They even, they even put a man who was traumatized 
his 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 family members kidnapped through this through a trial when all else was failing he convinced my officers did their very best to solve that crime we failed if we can't resolve it someone has not had the justice they deserve it 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 goes with the territory of policing sadly Karen McMullen broke down as she recalled how one of the men began wrapping tape around her head. Reliving that moment, she began gasping for air and simply couldn't speak. In the Oops. Republic of Ireland, the money laundering investigation did lead to some convictions. That's about it. You found them cold turkey, dead to right, money on them. Ted Cunningham is escorted from court, the first person jailed in connection with Ireland's biggest ever robbery. Go to white collar prison, he ain't even probably do no real time. Yeah. Father Judge answer. Colin Murphy then sentenced the pair, starting with his son. Giving him a three year suspended sentence, he said it was quite clear he'd been acting under the influence and direction of his father. Jo hey, that's fair. Okay. Three years suspended. All right. He was getting brainwashed by his dad. That was the defense. All right. Judge Murphy then dealt with Ted Cunningham. The judge said it was a grave offense and jailed him for 10 years. He got a 10 piece McNugget? In what jail, though? I'm on my way to see Ted Cunningham. He was convicted and sentenced for 10 years, but that conviction was overturned. Yeah, when you got money, it normally do get overturned. The second trial, he admitted two counts of money laundering. Today, he says he's innocent of all charges. You're still fighting, aren't you, after all these years? I will fight until the day I die. I know who I got the money from. And it was not from the Northern Bank. Not one note was proved to have been in the Northern Bank on the day. You can go through the transcripts of the trial. The forensic uh, Garda stated that all her investigations were negative and inconclusive. Where did Why'd you plead out then? That money comes Because that 10 years. From. It came from business associates that I was dealing with in Bulgaria. You admitted at the second trial to two counts. Why ultimately did you admit to right. those? Because I feared for my life with what I had experienced when I was in court prison. You regret agreeing to that, don't you? 100% if I had my way back again, I'd have gone to jail. But you know, now looking from the outside, a cynic would say, look, here's all this money in this man's house. Yes. He's been to Bulgaria recently. Yes, he's convicted, he gets off, fair enough. But then he actually admits guilt later on for two minor charges. It looks like a duck, it walks like a duck, it's a duck. Well, you can look at it this way. What other people think at this stage doesn't matter to me. As far as I'm concerned, the state, they needed a, a fall guy. You believe they needed a fall guy and you yes. were that fall guy? Yes, I am the victim. I can't say any more, but this is not the end of the story. He guilty. Brother, you're guilty. It's coming off real guilt. Brother. But why not? Yeah, I'd be seeking damages too. If I can prove the stuff, if I can, if I can go in the court and be like, there's not enough sufficient evidence 
to pin this on me and I want to clear my name and I'm, I'm seeking damages because yeah of course even if I was guilty I was I would still shoot my shot I'm definitely gonna do that. I'm definitely gonna attempt for 2.4. I'm attempting it. For Ted Cunningham to have been the victim of injustice here, it would have taken, you know, an awful lot of people oh. working with and for the Irish state. to have colluded, to have conspired to get him fitted up. Now, we know he's taking um, Possible. proceedings. Those proceedings continue against the Irish state to prove his innocence. Maybe when they conclude, we can finally then make a judgment, a final judgment, as to his innocence or guilt and all of this. Mad stuff. In total, there were three convictions for laundering Northern Bank money. But that accounts for only a tiny fraction of what was stolen. We know that Good about boy. 16 and a half million pounds became worthless. I've never even heard of anybody getting that six year suspended sentence. Six years suspended? You normally do like two, three, and then get out on, you know what I'm saying? Six years? Oh yeah, we're going to use six years, but you just, it's whatever. you good when the bank redesigned their notes. But the IRA still had about 10 million pounds that was untraceable. What happened to that cash? The view uh, of those people that might have known that I ever asked told me it was as simple or as complicated as this, that it was the pension fund. For? Guys who were pulling away from IRA activities. I don't disagree with that. Whilst it's entirely unjustifiable, of that course sounds, it is, if you are trying to keep people legit. on board and keep them behaving in a way within the context of a peace process, you, you, that would be an understandable thing for them to try and do, to almost pave them off, I suppose. There is no evidence of it being paid as a pension to IRA volunteers, as some people have suggested. And the only aspect of the Republican movement that still exists, we're told by Republicans, is Sinn Féin. One of the American um, diplomatic cables that was released by WikiLeaks shows that in 2005, the American diplomats in Dublin were being told by the Department of Justice in Dublin that they were concerned that money from the robbery and from other illegal IRA activities was seeping, as they said, into Sinn Féin's political activities. I would be very, very surprised if there was a leak-proof silo between uh, the, the monies that were accumulated through crime and the monies that were um, laundered in other ways into the Irish political system. But it's quite a serious charge. Do you have any proof? Do you have any evidence? How, but I can't possibly prove any of this. Did you find any evidence of that? No. No, had we, we would have pursued it. I think it's an entirely legitimate question. Politics has to be transparent in every way. And part of that is being transparent about the legacy of the past. Bottom line, we don't actually know what happened to this money. Some of it, though, you imagine, still has to be out there. And someone must control it if it's out there. Absolutely. They're still probably using that money right now. More mute? More than bank robbery. Oh, okay. In a key question, was the Northern Bank robbery an important factor in moving the Republican movement along? We know that Gerry Adams was saying privately to the British government, well before the Northern Bank robbery, the IRA will go away. It's just about how and when and managing that process. 
But I think what it probably did, I think we can say, is it sped that process up. All IRA units. It makes sense like, to me, low key. Seven months after the robbery. All right, cool. We good. We gonna end my armed campaign. We out of here. Salute. It makes I've been sense. ordered to dump arms. All volunteers have been instructed to assist the development of purely political and democratic programs through exclusively peaceful means. Here's the thing. Do you think there might have been people at the heart of of British government, people who might have thought, let this robbery go ahead. There's a danger of us being too analytical about this and saying that because this led to the IRA going away, that therefore somebody must have known, somebody potentially let it happen. But ultimately, nobody we've spoken to has come forward with even any signal. Why would they come forward? Why would anybody up that information? Everybody, all parties are happy. You know what I'm saying? Like, at the time of this, all parties was happy. Everything was done. Why would anybody come forward and ruin that silence? Ruin Significant the, concern that that's what happened. Ruin the vibe. There would have been some almighty chess players to figure out what was going to happen next. First Minister, Deputy First Minister, T-Shock, ladies and gentlemen, it's a very great honor to be with you today. Today, the elected representatives of the people of Northern Ireland have taken responsibility for the future of Northern Ireland. I was reading back some of the historical papers that they will only tell a fraction of the story because we had set up our own network about how we would do phone calls and that we would get away from the recording of everything. Is, is that good for open government? Um, it's good for trying to get things done. Um, from the point of view of historians, they can write books about what's left. <laughs> that sounds like, that sound like some Will the shit. Northern Bank robbery ever be solved? No, no, I don't think so. It's over. 2024 now. What fool <laughs> would, would go and spend time in prison for that? Because then I'd be out in two years. You'd get a hefty old whack for that. I wouldn't mind betting there's still some guy sitting with a bunker with bricks of Northern Bank fibers in it. <laughs> Essentially, that's the biggest bank robbery in the UK, and, and nobody's ever been, or in Ireland, nobody's ever been convicted. They got away with it. That's, that's superb clout. <laughs> and that's it. That's intense. I swear, every time, every everything in, in Ireland... Seems like it could be a Netflix special. I swear. I, I know it'd be serious stuff going on, but it just, all of it could be movie, movied. Every piece of it. Tell or leave a like comment.